Why Marx? Why indeed? He's been dead for 140 years. His close collaborator, Frederick Engels, lived a little bit longer, but both died in the 19th century when capitalism looked very, very different compared to today. There are certainly things in the writings of Marx and Engels that are somewhat out of date and perhaps need updating. Would be a miracle if not. Um, Marx and Engels purposefully never wrote uh, what they called a blueprint of what communism uh, would look like. On the one hand, I mean, that's a shame, obviously, for us. On the other, they understood, of course, that capitalism is constantly revolutionizing, not just the means of production, but also the way people live, love and work. It's impossible to foresee the future. We have to make the future in today's entirely different uh, conditions. But Marx and Engels remain hugely important for the, today's struggles for three main reasons, um, which we'll come back to throughout this uh, series. Firstly, they explained how capitalism came into being. It wasn't the natural progression, you know, things just become more democratic and more democratic. It was a series of very violent struggles, revolutions, and of course, protests by those below. Secondly, they explained how capitalism works, how the inbuilt need to make a profit leads to constant expansion and going with it, the uh, total exploitation of humanity and the planet. This need to exploit is part and parcel of capitalism as a system. It's not about bad bankers or Elon Musk or this or that company polluting a river. It's a system based on the means of production in private hands. That is the base that creates its own superstructure. The laws, police, armies, schools, media, they're all there to protect and recreate capitalism in its current form through, through force sometimes, but mainly through ideology. Thirdly, Marx and Engels explained how to overcome capitalism and establish a truly human society, what they called communism. And for this, it requires, they explained, the active and the conscious actions of the majority of the working class that needs to make revolution. Marx and Engels were not just arguing from the outside. They weren't just uh, theoreticians. They were that, obviously, but they were also activists. So if you have, for example, the collected works of Marx and Engels at home, you'll know that they've written an awful lot. There are 50 volumes in English, and that's just what's been translated into English. There's more. But they also threw themselves into the political struggles of their time, not just as cheerleaders, but critical participants who did not subordinate their politics. So they were very involved, for example, in the first international. Um, they fought huge battles uh, against the spontaneity of the anarchists who argued against party building and against winning over the majority of the working class. And much of their arguments, I think we can, they're still prevalent today and we can see some of them today, for example, in, the, in some of the, the green direct action movements. Um, and it has to be said, the program of groups like Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil. They have an actual program uh, devised by Roger Hallam that you just need to win 3.5% of the population because apparently that is enough to convince the government to take radical action if 3.5% support you. And the best way to you know, get 3.5% is perhaps to create chaos, make headlines, <laughs> and more often than not, as we've seen, unfortunately, piss off the working class by blocking motorways, walking through, slowly through London, etc. Marxists uh, should and do engage with, with these campaigns, of course, but we should stress that we have a rather different program. Firstly, we believe that fiddling about on the edges of capitalism will not and cannot stop the climate catastrophe. Stopping oil, for example, will not stop the climate catastrophe. Even if everybody on the planet had solar panels or electric cars, it will not stop the climate catastrophe. We need to do away with this whole system and replace it with a truly human society. And secondly, this can only be done if we win over the majority of the working class to a program for socialism, not 3.5%, not a putsch, not a dictatorship, but the extension of democracy, which we believe brings with it the liberation of, of all of humanity. We should say from the outset in this series, the people who are behind this series are not dogmatist. Well, we would say that, wouldn't we? But we do come all from, from various, from different political backgrounds. Some of us are organized in left-wing groups. Others are currently unaffiliated. We have varying degrees of experience on the left, and we disagree with each other on some issues. In fact, some of the sessions, we are trying to seek out differences. 
Um, we believe that helps to clarify and make ideas more accessible and for people to understand. So we definitely sh share the desire amongst us to critically re-examine what Marx and Engels have written and to do so in a democratic and open way. And we do urge comrades to get actively involved in shaping this series, not just with contributions from the floor, but also as the uh, contributors and panel speakers. I'll put our contact details in the chat later. Um, next week, for example, we want to look at the question, what is socialism? Sounds easy, but it's actually quite a difficult question to answer. And you'd probably get a lot of different answers if you speak to, to people on the left. And there are different interpretations among us too. Is it the same as communism? Is it the transition to, co to communism? Um, will the means of production still be in private hands for how long, et cetera, et cetera. We don't believe it's a problem that there are different views among us, but it's a sign of a, of a healthy culture of debate. Um, we do agree, for example, that in our assessment, the USSR and Stalinism had very little to do with socialism. For a start, there's no such thing as socialism in one country. Some of, if, of, some of us think it was the opposite of socialism because the working class clearly was not in charge. And we will come back to those questions in the series. The other key thing, though, and I think that is perhaps the, the most important thing for us, is that Marxist politics the idea that the need for communism and revolution is very much for now, not for some time in the future that we put off and now we kind of pretend to be social democrats or you know, whatever. It's a Marxism is a political method that should shape how socialists and communists today engage with, with the current strike wave, the green direct action activists and the left in and around the, the Labour Party and with others internationally, of course. So engaging flexibly uh, flexibly and, and critically, but we should not subordinate our politics. And I'll finish with this, with this short quote from, from the Communist Manifesto. In, in short, the communists everywhere support every revolutionary movement against the existing social and political order of things. In all these movements, they bring to the front as the leading question in each, the property question, no matter to what its degree of development at the time, the communists disdain to conceal their views and aims. They openly declare that their ends can be attained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling class tremble at a communistic revolution. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. We do engage with all movements, but the question is how, how do we do it? By fighting openly for Marxist politics in, in our view. And that is very much uh, true today as it was then, and it's even more urgent now considering the impending climate catastrophe and the real danger of World War III.